My name is David Chan from Ancient Arts. Today we're going to look at what life was like in the Iron Age. Life in the Roundhouse would have focused around the hearth and the light and heat it provided. Most British roundhouses have their hearths in the centre, giving a uniform light and heat for the whole structure. Smoke rising from the fire into the roof would reflect some of the light back down into the house. Further evidence for lighting has been found, such as this replica lamp from the Great Horn Copper Mines. This consists of a concave pebble with a moth's wick and animal fat or bone marrow for fuel. Here the wick is lit from the fire and transferred to the lamp. At this time, bread had become the staple food. It was made predominantly from barley and wheat grain. Unlike the magnificent windmill here at Llanon today, which produces flour mechanically and efficiently, prehistoric people had to grind the grain by hand. In the Bronze Age, they used a saddle quern, a flat, coarse grain stone with a small grinding stone held in the hand, a laborious and physically hard job. The grain may have been softened by soaking overnight. The flour made is coarse and includes small fragments of grit from the quern stones themselves, leaving our ancestors' teeth badly worn. Later in the Iron Age, a more efficient rotary quern was developed. Here, grain enters the quern through a hole at the top and is ground and forced out the sides as a coarse flour. Still hard work though. Once ground, the flour is made into dough and put in a clome oven like this one here at the Thlanon. The clome oven is made on a stone base and its structure built up with a mixture of clay and straw. The oven is then dried out, a fire lit inside and left to die down. The ashes are then raked out and the dough put in to bake. The stone and clay walls will have been heated by the fire and will now slowly release the residual heat thus baking the bread. In addition to the bread, fruits and nuts would have been collected for food, as would greens, fungi, fish and other seafoods. Primitive breeds of sheep, pigs and cattle would have been kept, providing meat, skins, bone, horn, sinews and wool. Wool would also have been used to produce textiles. The stone discs which form spindle whorls, seen here at the top of drop spindles, are often found on excavations of roundhouses. They were used to spin the wool. Dyes made from plants such as woad, weld, brambles and nettles were used to add colour to the wool. The wool would then have been woven into textiles on looms such as this one at Llanon. Bark, wood and leather containers would have been used for storage and mixing, but little pottery is found at this time. What there was was of poor quality, unable to take direct heat from the fire. For heating liquids, some families may have had high status bronze or iron cauldrons, but there is also evidence that a more primitive technique using heated stones was used. This is done by heating stones under a bonfire. After half an hour or so, the stones are uncovered. Some may have already shattered in the fire. The stones are then put into a water-filled leather bag or leather cauldron. Thermal shock will shatter some of the stones, making the telltale pot boilers found during excavations. The water will start to boil. Once boiled, the occasional added hot stone will maintain the temperature. Large amounts of heat shattered stones are also found on sites called burnt mounds. 
Here, ash-covered burnt stones are seen eroding out of a slope on the Clean Peninsula. In 2008, Ancient Arts and Gwynedd Archaeological Trust excavated the site to find out what it had been used for. This revealed a Bronze Age oak plank trough surrounded with blackened stones and a wooden launder leading into the trough from an old stream bed. There are many theories about what this was used for. We decided to test the most attractive theory, which is that it was used for making ale. A replica wooden trough was made and placed into a slot in the ground and filled with water. A bonfire was lit over the stones and the heated stones were removed from the fire and placed into a basket in the trough, soon boiling the water. The water was then left to cool a little and malted barley added. Crushed elderberries were added as a source of yeast to ferment the brew. The resulting mix was sieved to remove the barley which can be used to make bread and the brew left to ferment for five days. The experiment produced 77 pints of drinkable ale and everyone survived. The most important technological advance that would have affected the roundhouse dwellers was the increased use of metal, first bronze and then iron. Stone and wooden tools were still used but bronze tools such as this axe and highly decorated items such as this mirror would have been effective tools and valuable possessions. Bronze is made from a mixture of copper and tin. North Wales has two important prehistoric copper mines at Paris Mountain near Amlwch and the Great Orm Copper Mines in Llandidno. Turning copper ore into copper metal by a process called smelting could have been done in a small pit dug into the ground. A small groove is cut into the edge to allow air from a set of bag bellows to be blown into the pit. This beautiful green coloured ore is called malachite and would have been mined at the Great Orm in the Bronze and Iron Ages using stone hammers and tools made from animal bones. The ore is crushed on a small stone anvil. A fire lit in the pit and charcoal added. Crushed ore is then sprinkled onto the hot coals and the end of the bag bellows is placed in the pit and a cap of turf placed over the top. Air is then forced into the pit by the bellows. This will increase the temperature inside the pit creating a simple furnace. This is kept up for a couple of hours. Inside the pit a reducing atmosphere is produced. The carbon monoxide produced by the burning charcoal bonds with the carbon in the ore producing carbon dioxide and copper metal. This chemical reaction is what changes the ore into metal and not the temperature in the furnace. Changes in the curl of the flame coming out of the pit show how the smelt is progressing. When this is complete the turf cap is removed and the copper metal retrieved. metal is a pinky yellow in colour. The remaining fill of the pit is washed to check for smaller fragments of copper using a simple panning technique. These fragments are collected and put back into a crucible and melted together. Small amounts of tin or lead are added to produce the harder bronze alloy. This can then be poured into moulds, either stone ones or ones made from clay and dung. Once cooled the mould is opened and the bronze revealed. Around two and a half thousand years ago iron tools first start to appear in Wales. Iron is smelted from an ore such as hematite. 
a different type of furnace is needed for this as the temperature has to be significantly higher. Here slag from the ore runs out of the base of the furnace leaving the iron bloom inside. Once dug out the iron bloom has to be reheated and hammered to remove any remaining slag before it can be used. The iron is then hammered or forged into objects such as this knife blade. A wooden handle is attached and the knife is used in everyday life by the people of the roundhouses.